Some of us, maybe the vast majority of people, regardless of our religious practices or philosophical outlook on life, consider the words morality and goodness as synonyms signifying the same basic concept. However, that's a wholly inaccurate assessment of the two words that in a sense are more contradictory to one another than what one would expect. Morality is basically a set of rules separating right from wrong, like a useful pair of glasses, assisting a person with poor eyesight to function in his or her everyday life. However, true goodness is different and it is related to our own inner compass that makes us head effortlessly towards the right direction for us specifically. And it has nothing to do with mere ethics, but more with an inner guidance emitted from something higher, flowing effortlessly and naturally through us, keeping us in the right path for us, that may as well be totally incorrect if someone else attempted to follow it. To make things simple, the Ten Commandments, for example, are a basic moral guide. A set of moral glasses assisting people who have lost the ability to see clearly. Jesus' teaching, on the other hand, is more oriented to actually restoring our inner sight, so that the right path may become once again the only natural condition for us. A set of glasses is designed for a particular eye condition and may be completely useless or even harmful for someone who doesn't need them because he has flawless eyesight or is simply hindered by a different eye problem than our own. Would we force a pilot with excellent vision to wear glasses while flying his aircraft? Of course not. However, we enforce upon our children our ethical code from the moment they learn to communicate, though they clearly have no need of it, because they are naturally good and pure, and possess a flawless sense of what's right for them in terms of what feels natural to the child and what doesn't. The child is pleased when it sees beauty and justice prevail, and has no concept of compromise when it comes to those issues. If it sees a scary film, it will be unable to sleep at night and suffer from nightmares. If his parent punishes him or her unjustly, the child will be deeply shocked because injustice feels unnatural. Grown-ups tend to say, that's the way of the world, get used to it. But the child, in order to accept injustice as natural, needs to deny its very nature and become something completely different. So children have to actually bury a valuable part of themselves in order to fit inside the boxes we make for them. Now, for a more theoretical example, let's say that a person needs to face the dilemma of whether he conforms to society's precepts and actually denies himself of his inner essence, or follows the path that feels right to him and is actually happy, though this may mean that throughout his whole life he will be forced to face the judgmental side of others and be constantly lectured by people with little to no regard for his needs and feelings on matters of morality and social acceptance. I'll be honest and say exactly what I mean, though I risk amazing many people. If a person feels naturally and is totally at peace being a homosexual and knows he can only be happy if he meets and unites his life with a person of the same sex, and I'm not talking about someone promiscuous or superficial, in any sense, going from one partner to the next, like a bee to flowers, but of a sensitive person that needs real love and searches for a true soulmate, like any heterosexual would do. If he had the good fortune of living in a world where true emotions were revealed more than shallow, carnal relations. However, this orientation is not approved by his parents, his church, or his neighborhood. I am convinced 
of the such a person, the morally correct choice, according to strict Christian ethics, would come in perfect opposition with the actually good and honest choice to be true to himself and claim the right to love and be loved. The moral choice would be to suppress his needs, the good choice would be to embrace them. And by not having suppressed his needs, he will be less likely to become judgmental, self-righteous and arrogant, which is totally opposed to the heart of Christ's teaching and not a single teaching of his. And since I know many will judge me hastily and say I promote homosexuality, I will tell you that I'd like all people to be able to be acknowledged and appreciated by society and live an easier life without having to face constant attacks on who they are and what they want. In that sense, I wish all people were heterosexual so that no one had to face judgment, discrimination and attacks from others, but I know this isn't the case. Many people have inside them the need to express themselves this way and they have a right to be loved for who they are in the way they need to be loved. And since some will mention Paul and his own views on homosexuality, I feel the need to remind them that Paul was against heterosexual relations as well, and he would prefer it if no one had carnal relations. At the time of Paul, there wasn't a concept of homosexuality as a life bond of two people of the same sex. The only known homosexuality were the orgies of the Roman decadent nobility. So his attacks were directed against immorality in general and not against the type of homosexuality of today where we find people of the same sex to be practically in a marriage in the sense that they bond for life. As for their acts being natural or unnatural, I think we all know very well that anything that homosexuals do in their private lives, the heterosexual couples do as well without any remorse. If we all follow Paul's example, as he would like and stay celibate, soon Christianity would be extinct because Christians wouldn't reproduce, while members of the other religion would multiply as they do now. And frankly, I don't feel that the extinction of Christianity was Christ's or even Paul's intention. And since they wanted the gospel to spread to the entire world, if Paul's views were adopted universally, we are not talking only about the extinction of Christianity, but of humanity as well on a global level. Not a very good prospect, I think. Jesus' purpose was to establish the kingdom of heaven on earth, because, as he said, his father was the God of the living, not of the dead. So let's stop lying to ourselves and try to convince others of something completely irrational and unfounded. In my humble view, all relations between consenting adults are good as long as the individuals involved have love and respect for each other. The problem begins when something is imposed on someone by someone else. That's all I have to say on this matter. But let's take our reasoning a step further. What about intersex people having been born with the other characteristics of one sex while they have the chromosomes of the other, or hormonal imbalances that can't be easily handled? What is the right path for such a person? They can't all become monks. Jesus himself said that celibacy is not a path anyone can take. Consequently, this person having needs and desires like everyone else is forced to make a choice between what is dictated by his or her chromosomes and by what is dictated by his or her outer appearance. Whatever choice this person makes will be considered by some immoral, since in the case of a boy with female appearance, if he or she chooses to marry a man, there are many who will judge him or her on the basis of not being naturally a woman, and the grandparents will wait impatiently for them to get pregnant, an event that of course will never happen. On the other side, what if this person chooses a woman? Then they might be doing what comes naturally to them, but the society will again judge and easily call this person a lesbian. So what is moral in this case, and what is actually good? I'll tell you straightforwardly that no one can tell except him or herself. For that reason, one needs the inner compass of goodness to point one to the right direction in a case where conditions are unclear and morality 
has no clues to offer as to what is the truly right path in this specific case. For this reason, the well-intentioned conscientious parent needs to favor and cultivate the natural goodness of the child and never attempt to offer as a substitute a set of ethically pre-designed rules to cover for his fatherly or her, which is a woman motherly inadequacy, to follow and protect the natural goodness of the child without psychological manipulation and interference and self-righteous ethical hindrance. We are not qualified to lecture our children on the subject of goodness, but we have to give them unconditional, boundless love and let them find out what is good for them. That doesn't mean that the child should remain unprotected by his parents, exposing it so to every experience that may prove harmful for them. The parents have a simple duty. They need to assist the inner goodness of the child prevail, so that he or she finds the true way without hindering it or leaving it unprepared to be exposed to all sorts of experiences. When our search for happiness leads to immense trauma and misfortune, it means once again that something else guided the child to those wrong choices. Perhaps they need to fight the constrictions that the parents have enforced upon it, most of the time unwillingly and in complete ignorance of the harmful impact they are having on their kid's life. No child will disappear from the home looking for dangerous situations if they are allowed to remain connected with the initial goodness they came endowed with into this world. It's actually the false morality that becomes an oppressing, tyrannical yoke to the child and exposes it to danger and not its natural tendencies. Often children from extremely oppressing family backgrounds become totally immoral in nature out of mere reaction to the fact that their parents offered them moral glasses when in fact they did owe to the child the freedom to manifest his naturally good self, to emphasize and encourage the natural goodness, instead of a blind submission to the code of ethics. That simply may not apply for one reason or another in the specific case. If the child at any time of its life comes to a point of feeling unhappy, well, seemingly he or she does everything right, goes to a good school, has good grades, is polite to his parents and acceptable by society. If it feels miserable, there is a need for a serious inner examination of itself and the mending of the broken bond with its inner existential compass and guidance that prompts to happiness. We live in a society where every inner condition is a matter of a specific prescription drug or medicine of some form or another, a pill for depression, a pill for too much joy, a pill for too much rage, a pill for every emotion or attitude that is not conforming to the system's predesigned set of values. I need to tell you this. The negative forces of this world, whether one sees them as material or immaterial, as secret elites of powerful people on earth or as dark supernatural powers affecting our choices, have had quite an experience in distorting God's word or any other code of ethics by making it seem incompatible with modern times and by not allowing it to take root in every individual the way he or she really needs it to take root and bear the fruit of true goodness. So, to make another symbolic representation, if one of the Ten Commandments or a completely different set of moral instructions like don't do anything to others or you wouldn't want others to do to you, a golden rule appearing in many religions, in one form or another, is in its essence a form of spiritual seed. Then, natural goodness is the tree the seed originated from and has the inner ability to become a new tree of true goodness and produce its own fruit and seeds, thus filling the vast cosmic forest of our world with an abundance of life. Glasses are an attempt to face the symptom of poor eyesight, however, if one has serious eye problems, and there is corrective surgery to face them once and for all by restoring his full capacity to see clearly free from the inconvenient glasses that he always loses and that leave an ugly scar on his nose, he certainly must follow this choice and be healed. It isn't easy, but it is beneficial. Sticking to morality with dogmatic persistence 
makes us safer, but it doesn't make us free, good or happy. Therefore, we need to make the truly beneficial choice and protect our children from ever needing ethics to keep on the right path. We need to preserve the natural condition and mend our own connection with the inner spiritual compass. The valuable instinctive and oasis, meaning inner vision, allowing us to do naturally what leads to our happiness in this world and the next of us believing in an afterlife. So yes, when a child is seriously ill, perhaps it needs more severity. It needs strict dietary rules and medicinal therapy and every type of precaution in order to stay alive. That was the reason for the Ten Commandments and the severity of the Mosaic Law. Humanity was a sick child who needed specific instructions in order to survive the first symptoms of the disease. However, when the first symptoms are successfully faced through this strict therapy, the doctor does not concentrate on fighting sickness anymore, but on restoring health. So the therapy is not the same in the case of someone who first contracts a virus or disease, and for someone towards the recuperation and full restoration of his health. Now more than ever, we need to concentrate on health, not on sickness, more to goodness than to morality. With this, I close this post and remind the words of Jesus from John 10.10. I have come that they may have life, and that they may have it more abundantly. If you enjoyed this video, please like and subscribe.